It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Hello, 153B students. You saw in lecture that it's very useful in molecular biology to be able to predict the melting temperature of short pieces of DNA. For example, as we saw, PCR works best if we carry out the annealing step at just a few degrees below the melting temperature of the primers, and so we need to be able to calculate those melting temperatures. But we also saw that the marmer doty method does a terrible job of predicting the melting temperature of short DNA molecules. So we need a better method. The purpose of this video is to describe such a method, called the nearest neighbor method, uh, which is the approach that has been routinely used for at least the last 30 years or so to calculate melting temperature of short pieces of DNA, such as PCR primers. Before I describe this method, I want to remind you of these two equations for calculating free energy changes. Recall that spontaneous reactions always reduce the free energy of a system, and that a system achieves equilibrium by minimizing its free energy. So when we calculate melting temperature, what we're really doing is calculating the temperature below which the free energy change for duplex formation will be a negative number. These two equations will help us to do that calculation. The first relates free energy change to the enthalpy and entropy changes of a system, while the second relates the free energy under standard conditions to the equilibrium constant. The nearest neighbor approach for calculating the melting temperature of DNA involves two steps. First, we calculate the enthalpy and entropy of duplex formation for a segment of DNA of known sequence. As you'll be seeing, the calculation takes nearest neighbor uh, interactions into account. This is different from the marmer doty method since to apply the marmer doty equation, you only need to know what fraction of the base pairs are GC base pairs. For the nearest neighbor method, you need to know each base pair's nearest neighbors. In other words, for each base pair, you need, to, you need to know the identity of the adjacent base pairs. And the only way you're going to know that is if you know the sequence of the DNA. Then once we have these enthalpy and entropy values, we need to plug them into an equation for TM and evaluate the equation. So we're going to have to derive an equation, and when we do that, we'll see that the equation is analogous to the equation relating the melting temperature of a pure substance such as water to the enthalpy and entropy of fusion. Since delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, it follows that delta G for the conversion of ice to water at the melting temperature is given by the equation uh, delta G fusion equals delta H fusion minus the TM times delta S fusion. Recall that the TM for a phase transition is the temperature at which the two phases are equally stable. Therefore, we can set the equation equal to zero. Then, by solving for TM, we can show that uh, TM equals delta H fusion divided by delta S fusion. So we're going to be deriving an equation for DNA melting temperature, which, which is analogous to this one. Except, uh, as we'll see, DNA melting temperature depends on the DNA concentration, and so we're going to end up with an equation that includes a concentration term. So here is the procedure that we'll be using to calculate the free energy, enthalpy, and entropy of helix formation. Imagine that we have two three nucleotide long pieces of single-stranded DNA that are complementary to one another. How are we going to calculate the free energy, enthalpy, and entropy changes for forming the duplex from these two pieces of single-stranded DNA? Well, the calculation depends upon the fact that enthalpy, entropy, and free energy are all state functions. That means that the change in these properties in going from one state to another is independent of the path taken. So if we can break the process of duplex formation into a series of discrete steps for which we know uh, the 
values of the state functions for the individual steps, then we can just add the values for the individual steps together to get the change in the state function for the overall process of duplex formation. In this example, we've broken this process up into three steps. We start out in step one by forming the base pair on the left, which in this example is a TA base pair. And then we proceed to form one base pair at a time going from left to right. So in step two, we form the central base pair, which happens to be an AT base pair. And in step three, we form the base pair on the right, which is a GC base pair. So if we can calculate the values of these state functions for these three steps, we can just add them together to get the values of the state functions for the formation of this three base pair duplex. As you'll see soon, uh, these values for the individual steps are something that we can look up in the scientific literature. And so using those literature values, we can calculate the free energy, enthalpy, and entropy of helix formation. This is, of course, just one of multiple pathways we could have chosen. For example, we could assume that uh, the base pair in the center form first, followed by the base pair on the right, uh, and then the base pair on the left. No matter which of these pathways we chose, if we uh, added up the values for the changes in these parameters for the individual steps, we would discover that they always sum up to the same value owing to the fact that these are state functions. So delta G1 prime, delta G2 prime, and delta G3 prime uh, will be different from delta G1, delta G2, and delta G3, but their sums will be the same. In practice, we'll see that the easiest way to do the calculation is to assume that the base pair, that base pair formation always begins at the left end of the, of the duplex and proceeds one base pair at a time to the right until we reach the right end of the duplex. So where do we get the values for the changes in free energy, enthalpy, and entropy that accompany each of these steps? Well, as I said, they have all been determined experimentally and we can look them up. And here is a table of values from a 22-year-old biochemistry paper. The first 10 rows of the table show all the so-called nearest neighbor interactions. For example, this row of the table gives the standard free energy, enthalpy, and entropy changes for forming a TA base pair next to, a, to an AT base pair. The base pair on the right is the one that is forming, and we call that one base pair J. And the base pair immediately to its left is called base pair I. So each of these rows uh, tells us the free energy, enthalpy, and entropy change for forming a base pair of type J next to a base pair of type I. Given that there are four types of base pairs, this means that there are four times four, or 16 different possible nearest neighbor interactions. But it actually turns out that there are a number of equivalent pairs of interactions. For example, forming a base pair of type TA next to a base pair of type TA is geometrically and therefore thermodynamically equivalent to forming a base pair of type AT next to a base pair of type AT. So those two interactions occupy the same row of the table and so we only need 10 rows of the table to define all 16 nearest neighbor interactions. These last two rows of the table are the nucleation parameters. The term nucleation is often used to describe the onset of a phase transition, such as crystallization. In this case, we call these the nucleation parameters because they are the ones that we assign to the formation of the first base pair. Remember that when you form that first base pair, it isn't next to any other base pair, so we need special values for the nucleation step. So let's think about how we use this table. If we want to determine the standard free energy for forming a helix, we would first determine a helix growth parameter. 
we would determine how many nearest neighbor interactions there were of each of the 10 types. We would then multiply the values from the table by the number of times each nearest neighbor interaction occurs, and then we would add up all those products. In other words, uh, we determine how many nearest ne neighbor interactions there are of type IJ. Then we multiply that number by the free energy value from row IJ of the table, and then sum up over all the possible values of IJ. To that, we have to add the free energy of the nucleation step, uh, one of the values from the last two rows of the table. Let's work an example. Here's the three base pair duplex we looked at earlier. The procedure I'm going to describe to you is easiest to use if we write out the sequences of the two strands as I've done here with the top strand in the five prime to three prime direction and the bottom strand in the three prime to five prime direction. Then we choose the pathway in which base pair formation starts on the left and the duplex grows one base pair at a time from left to right. It's important to realize that we're choosing this pathway for reasons of convenience and not because this is the actual pathway for forming the duplex. So using that approach then it might seem like the first base pair to form is a TA base pair and that we should therefore use this value from the bottom row of the table, namely 2.8 kcals per mole. However, it turns out that in general, duplexes prefer to nucleate at GC base pairs. So we only use these values in the bottom row of the table if there are no GC base pairs anywhere in the sequence. Since this trimer has a GC base pair, then we use this value from the nucleation GC row of the table, which is 1.82 kcals per mole. This might seem confusing to you, and we can discuss it in office hours, but for now just remember the rule, which is that if the duplex contains even one GC base pair, then we use the GC nucleation parameters regardless of the identity of the leftmost base pair. It's only for duplexes that contain no GC base pairs that we use the AT nucleation parameters. In the next step after nucleation, we form an AT base pair next to a TA base pair. Let's look for that in the table. Here it is. The free energy value is negative 0.6 kcals per mole. Then the, th then the third step is the formation of a GC base pair next to an AT base pair. Here it is in the table. The value is negative 1.16 kcals per mole. If we, combine these two, if we combine these three numbers together, they sum up to 0.06 kcals per mole. To figure out what this tells us, we need to know the temperature at which these free energy values were determined, which happens to be 37 degrees. So our calculation tells us that the free energy of duplex formation for this particular duplex is positive at 37 degrees. Therefore, we can conclude that this duplex will not be stable at 37 degrees because, remember, spontaneous processes are always associated with a negative free energy change. In other words, this duplex must have a melting temperature somewhere below 37 degrees. Now that you know how to calculate the free energy change of duplex formation, you also know how to determine the enthalpy and entropy of duplex formation since we use completely analogous summation procedures to determine all three state functions. The next step is to derive an equation for Tm into which we can plug these enthalpy and entropy values. We'll assume that we have two distinguishable complementary strands, S1 and S2, that associate with one another to form a DNA duplex. We can start by writing out an equation for the standard free energy of helix formation at the TM. It's equal to the negative of the gas constant, 
times Tm times the natural log of the equilibrium constant for this reaction. It's also equal to the standard enthalpy change for helix formation minus the Tm times the standard entropy change of helix formation. Next, we can solve this equation for Tm, and this is what we get. So if we can evaluate this equation, we can determine the Tm. You now know how to calculate these enthalpy and entropy values for any given duplex, but what you don't yet know is how to determine this equilibrium constant. To do that, we need an expression for K in terms of DNA concentration. C sub T is the total concentration of DNA strands, and it equals the concentration of strand 1 plus the concentration of strand 2 plus 2 times the concentration of the duplex. The reason for the coefficient of 2 in front of the concentration of the duplex is that every mole of duplex contains 2 moles of DNA strands. Since we're at the Tm, then we also know that the concentration of strand 1 plus the concentration of strand 2 is equal to 2 times the concentration of the duplex. Why is that? Well, remember how we determine Tm. To determine Tm, we measure the absorbance of UV radiation as a function of temperature. As we increase the temperature, the DNA melts, and we get a hyperchromic shift. By definition, the Tm is the temperature at the midpoint of this transition. In other words, it's the temperature at which half the DNA is double-stranded and half the DNA is single-stranded. So as indicated right here, this equation is just a mathematical expression of the definition of the Tm. Finally, we need to make an assumption about the relative concentrations of strand 1 and strand 2. And for this derivation, we're going to assume that we have equal concentrations of the two strands. If you combine these three equations with one another, you can show that at the Tm, the concentration of strand 1 equals the concentration of strand 2, which equals the concentration of the duplex, which equals C sub t over 4. The equilibrium constant for this reaction at the Tm is therefore just C sub t over 4 divided by C sub t over 4 squared which equals 4 over c sub t. When we plug 4 over c sub t into this equation for k, this is what we get. The Tm equals the standard enthalpy of helix formation divided by the standard entropy of helix formation plus r times the logarithm of c sub t divided by 4. So the Tm depends on concentration, which is exactly what we expect based on Le Chatelier's principle. Before I go on, I just want to mention that the equation I just derived is for the case where the two DNA strands are distinct from one another. Sometimes, however, a DNA strand has the same sequence as its complement, and the resulting duplex has twofold symmetry. Here's an example of such a duplex in which both strands read GGA TCC in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So the top strand is GGA TCC, reading from left to right, and the bottom strand is GGA TCC, reading from right to left. If we derive the formula for the Tm of a duplex that forms from a self-complementary strand, we see that the result is slightly different from the formula for the Tm of a duplex containing two distinguishable strands. In particular, we have to add a symmetry correction to the entropy of helix formation. In addition, the argument to the log function in the denominator turns out to be c sub t rather than c sub t over 4. To finish up, I'd like to return to this table. A little while ago, I indicated that these values were determined experimentally. Now that I've derived an equation relating Tm to the enthalpy and entropy of duplex formation, 
I'm in a position to describe these experiments to you, which are published in this 1996 paper by Santa Lucia et al. Here's the equation that gives the TM uh, when we have two distinguishable strands, and here's the equation that gives the TM when we have one self-complementary strand. Just as we can use these equations to calculate TM from enthalpy and entropy of duplex formation, we can use the equation in reverse to go from experimentally measured melting temperatures to the enthalpy and entropy of duplex formation. One convenient way to do this is to take the reciprocal of both sides of the equation. When we do that, we get these two relationships. The one on the top is for the case of two distinguishable strands, while the one on the bottom is for the case of a single self-complementary strand. These equations predict that a graph of the natural log of the total DNA concentration versus one over the TM will give a straight line in which these are the slopes and these are the y-intercepts. Here from Santa Lucia et al., we see a number of graphs of this type uh, generated using several different DNA sequences. By fitting these lines to one of these equations, they determine the enthalpy, entropy, and free energy of helix formation for each sequence. Altogether, Santa Lucia applied this approach to 44 duplexes. Then using linear algebra, they calculated the nearest neighbor and nucleation parameters that best fit the experimentally determined enthalpy, entropy, and free energy of helix formation values. And so that's how Santa Lucia and coworkers determined these values. One simplification they made to slightly reduce the number of parameters that they had to fit was to assume that duplex nucleation was a purely entropic event. In other words, they assumed that the enthalpy of duplex nucleation was zero, and these parentheses are meant to indicate that these values are not, strictly speaking, experimentally determined, but rather are based on an assumption. So I'll leave you with the following question. Why is it reasonable to assume that helix nucleation is a purely entropic event? It's a beautiful